I'm very honored to be uh, asked to give this talk. And by the way, in the company of such lively co-presenters uh, and co-keynoters. But before I start the prepared uh, part of my, my talk to you, and it's a remarkably large crowd, thank you for coming. Um, I, I, I want to greet those of you who are teachers here in, in Amsterdam, uh, because I, I want to give you a, a note of thanks from the USA. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, know uh, how important this city has been to the liberal tradition in that formed my own country. Uh, John Locke, who's the intellectual father of, uh, of the United States, uh, was uh, finished uh, several key works in this city in the 17th century. Uh, and where better to polish up uh, his works on the human mind and society than in Amsterdam, which was the 17th century center, really, of advanced thought in the West. Uh, a place of intellectual refuge. Spinoza had already been here. He had just died. Uh, Locke and his friends knew Spinoza's ideas, and those gave the brave Englishman, who was already uh, on the outskirts of thought, uh, the courage he needed to follow the argument where it led, especially the argument about society and early education. He felt, uh, as you know, the famous theory of the blank slate for the human infant. It's a theory that's going to be a, a, a very big role in the talk I'm going to present today. Essentially, the blank slate theory of human society and education held that what humans ought to do in their governance and in their education of the young uh, ought not to be decided by reveal, uh, received rules, revealed rules, not by scripture, not by some dogmatic prophet, not revealed even by what later thinkers were to call nature who is the goddess of our present day world. Not by revelation, but by reason. The great idea that was nurtured here in Amsterdam was that our politics and the education of our children were both to be governed by experience and logic. Education and society were to be guided by the way things work which was also the, the great principle in the United States, the pragmatic tradition. Do what works, never mind the theory. Never mind what some supposedly divine scripture says. When I say that those Amsterdam ideas founded the United States, I, I, I want to mention to you a, a little known fact about uh, the American founding. Thomas Jefferson is given credit for having written the words of our Declaration of Independence. That's independence from Great Britain, but he did not write all of those words, uh, not even the most important ones. Our Declaration was a committee assignment, and the committee had other worthies, including John Adams and Benjamin Franklin. The most famous and important words of our own declaration are these. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, was, in a way, an even truer child of uh, the American Revolution and of the intellectual revolution that Locke started. Uh, he uh, said that Jefferson's original version needed to be amended. Uh, Jefferson 
uh, had written, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. That was Jefferson's first. And Franklin said, no, I recommend we say these truths are self-evident, taking it out of the realm of revealed scripture. Human affairs uh, are best conducted by what works, not by abstract doctrine or revealed scripture, not even the claim that what you are doing is governed by nature or what nature has revealed as to be developmentally appropriate and so on. Uh, they, that's our, our modern version of revealed scripture. It turns out to have no more scientific validity than any other claim to divine guidance, whether from the Bible or uh, somewhere else. The educational standard is not the child's inherent nature, which, as you remember, Locke called a blank slate. And rightly, as we will see, effective educational policy needs to be guided by the agreed on goals of a democratic society. Effective educational policy uh, means carrying out those goals. So in honor of Locke, thank you Amsterdam for giving me the chance for talking to another audience about this subject. Uh, now I want to introduce, I, this, that was the first mode of introduction. I, I have another little introductory uh, point, and that is uh, a volume that arrived on my desk just a couple of weeks ago. And it forms a fine orientation to what I hope to convey. Uh, and you'll see why I was thrilled to, uh, by the end to, to see this publication. Uh, it's from the National Academy of Sciences, and every, oh, 10 years or so, it produces another uh, book or compilation about what science has to say about learning. And uh, earlier, uh, in, in the year 2000, the National Academy of Sciences had released a book called How People Learn, and Brain, Mind, Experience, School. And the chief results of that earlier book were the ones that I'll talk about in the first part of my talk. And the first chapter of that publication were about the differences between experts and novices. Uh, and uh, you've, uh, this, in this uh, series of, of talks, you've already heard from Anders Ericsson, who is a, a world-renowned expert on, on that issue of expertise what the nature of expertise is and how you bring somebody to be an expert. Um, and uh, here's the, uh, uh, that publication of, of 2000. But then two decades later, we have a second uh, volume published and its title is How People Learn, Learners, Contexts, and Cultures. And the focus is no longer the individual mind, you notice, uh, no longer how you distinguish between expert and, and uh, a novice. Uh, it's learning is conditioned and fostered by the shared language, the shared knowledge, and the shared values of a society in which the learning occurs. And its opening chapter is called Context and Culture, the cultural nature of learning the role of culture in learning and development, learning as a social activity. One of the most striking consensus findings is the now overwhelming evidence that learning does not reliably follow uh, the traditional Piagetian stages. Our learning stages are partly socially constructed. Our minds are socially constructed. I'll come back to that. Nature has decided <laughs> that the development of the human mind is largely up to the human group. That's the blank slate. To be truly natural, we need to be social and cultural. We need to use a language. 
Let me turn now to the remarks that I had originally prepared some weeks ago before this volume came out. But I wanted you to see that what I'm saying is, is not some off-base, uh, unaccepted view. It's the general principles that are now accepted widely in psychology. I, uh, I want to start with the first volume that we saw. Uh, it's probably the, the most important single principle uh, that cognitive psychology has developed in recent years. The technical term for it is the domain specificity of knowledge. Its simplest form, say in sports, is pretty obvious. Being good at tennis uh, does not make you good at golf or soccer. You may be a talented person with great hand-eye coordination, but being a first-class swimmer will still not make you a good hockey player. But then what about those general skills that we hear about uh, that educational experts on both sides of the Atlantic uh, are claiming as being the aims of schooling? Uh, critical thinking skills, uh, you've heard of these, problem solving skills, uh, learning to learn. And it's obvious that we are told that in this new, ever-changing world, we can't be experts on everything. So what we need to do is learn how to learn. The proper aim, we're told, of elementary education is to learn those higher order, higher order skills uh, that will enable us to master novel problems as they come along. And so we have, a, here's a typical list of what these so-called 21st century skills are. Critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication. You've already heard from Anders Ericsson that these abstract skills don't exist. So we're offered, uh, in, instead of learning specific knowledge, we're told we ought to learn these general skills, but also our uh, scores on PISA and uh, elsewhere and uh, haven't uh, risen because actually uh, those skills are will in the wisps, uh, they don't exist. Now there is, of course, broad competence. People are broadly competent, but without exception, that wide competence is based on a wide range of specific knowledge in specific domains that are relevant to the case and the problem at hand. It's not some general skill that's applied to the specific case. Um, now I want to read you what actually one of those books says about that topic. <laughs> it's in, I'm, I'm afraid, scientific ease. I don't know how communicable it is, but I'll read it anyway. It's highly authoritative. Teaching for transfer within each discipline aims to increase transfer within that discipline. Research to date provides little guidance about how to help learners aggregate transferable competencies across disciplines. In other words, we, there are no general skills that allow you to cross from one discipline to another, from tennis to hockey. You can have transferable skills within hockey or something that's relevant to hockey, but I, I, you know my term hockey. <laughs> well, you can have uh, uh, skills in hockey, uh, greater skills, but you can't have skills in tennis from doing that. So let me give you a large scale example. It involves some 80 nations of the world uh, and it involves looking at the PISA results. And if you look closely, there's a fairly consistent correlation between a nation's rank in science and its rank in reading. So it looks as though reading competence has some sort of transferability to uh, competence in science. But that's because uh, 
this general test of reading for 15-year-olds in Pisa is a general knowledge test. It's uh, inherently a reading test is a knowledge test, uh, and if you know a lot of subjects, then science is going to be one of them. Well, that means there are no shortcuts. You can't learn a general skill and have it applicable to other domains. Domain knowledge is key in each and every case, and it's a paradox that this insight, which is one of the most important educational insights in history, uh, should have had arrived just at the time when the fad of 21st century skills uh, which are non-specific and non-existent should have reached a crescendo in our world. And nowhere <laughs> is the domain specific, uh, specificity of knowledge more pressingly true than in language comprehension itself. Here's an example. It's, uh, I'm afraid it's, a, it's a, an English language example, but it's, that's the language I'm most familiar with. Uh, the, uh, th there's a nursery rhyme we sing to children in America and, and England, uh, which is Polly put the kettle on. Polly put the kettle on, Polly put the kettle on, we'll all have tea. And if you think what a child needs to know to understand that little rhyme, uh, put the kettle on what? Uh, what's in the kettle? Uh, what's the connection between the kettle and having tea? And what does having tea mean? Must we all have tea? I won't even broach the social side of uh, having tea and the background knowledge you need to grasp the second stanza, which is, Suki, take it off again, Suki, take it off again. They've all gone away. Uh, <laughs> that's already into a class uh, uh, issue where you have both Polly and Suki who are doing work for you. Um, anyway, that little nursery saying, if we trace out its implications, demolishes uh, the, the 21st century skills utopia, doesn't it? I mean, uh, its implications go beyond the need for unspoken knowledge to understand the simplest speech. If we trace those implications in an accurate way uh, into the need for shared knowledge in a democracy uh, if a, in order to understand one, each other, uh, there's a lot of weight that we can put on Polly put the kettle on. So here's a first grade scene. How are we doing on time? Uh, I'm in the first grade class. Let's just take this example. And I'm reading aloud to my class of first graders. I don't know what grades this group tends to focus on. You may have the later grades, but if the early ones aren't well done, you'll have uh, graver problems. And I'm reading aloud a book about Babylon, and I pause and I ask the class whether those old cities were like Chicago, and we have a brief discussion about whether they had electricity and the internet and flushable toilets, and I figure that some of the children would already know the right answers, but other children with narrow experiences might have a 21st century concept, uh, concept of Babylon. They would think it was like Chicago or Amsterdam. And they'd be at a disadvantage, clearly, in understanding the story. And the confusion would persist and would build. But if we equalize the children's understanding by a short class discussion, that would put all of them on a par in understanding the story. So I'd be putting all the listeners on a more equal footing by having that discussion about Chicago. And in other words, our little class 
would be forming itself into what psychologists call a speech community. Speakers and listeners share the same silent understandings of what they hear and read and say. They all share similar unspoken background knowledge. They all know what a city is, and it did not mean television, it did not mean internet, and it did not mean the modern bathroom. If that background knowledge isn't known to every kid in first grade, there's ample opportunity to make clear, uh, to, to make it known to every child. So preschool and kindergarten and first grade, when humans are not yet overwhelmed with knowledge, those are not places where children should be encouraged to flourish and grow, quote, at their own natural pace, uh, which is what the Piagetian tradition uh, admonishes us to do. On the contrary, they are places where children should be deliberately and even artificially, by all sorts of tricks and ruses, be brought to know the things that will enable them to understand what comes next. That, that's the, it seems to me, principle. Being put in a position to understand what comes next. This, so the story is a preparation for something that will prepare them to learn the next uh, topic. Equal educational opportunity requires us to turn our elementary classrooms into shared speech communities. That's what, uh, that's what a speech community is. It's a community that understands what's being said because the participants have a shared background knowledge that enables them to understand the next thing that's being said. Effective classroom is always, therefore, a speech community. It's always taking place in a shared language, and there are no exceptions. Uh, I tried to find exceptions to that generalization, but in principle, it's not possible to find. Uh, it just as Polly put the kettle on, required us to know what hair, having tea means, the next lesson will require similar assumptions, and the prior lessons should have provided those necessary assumptions for understanding. Now, I'll skip my complaints about the progressive tradition in the United States, where children are offered whole arrays of bookshelves and libraries according to what their own inherent natures are, require, uh, are urging them uh, to read on the assumption that the interests of the child will teach you this general skill of reading. But we've just illustrated with Polly put the kettle on that there is no general skill of reading. There's no general skill of comprehension. Expertise is domain specific. Going back to that elemental principle and reading is a kind of expertise that is also domain specific for each and every domain that you're reading about. So uh, this brings me to the latest uh, science on the subject. What is natural and what was said to be natural, and this is going to bring us back to John Locke. What is said to be natural has been determined by evolution. But evolution is a pragmatist. It is not high-minded. It is red in tooth and claw. It mainly asks, how does this help our species survive? Let me quickly say that I emphatically agree with the late Sir Patrick Bateson, who is an English uh, cognitive psychologist, in his review of Sting, uh, Steven Pinker's book called The Blank Slate. Pinker's book argued fiercely against the blank slate in favor of a well-defined human nature. But Sir Patrick titled his negative review in the journal Science, The Corpse of a Wearisome Debate. That was the title of his review speaker, 
of Pinker. The endless nature-nurture debate is indeed wearisome, but a lot of scientific work has come out since the publication of, of Pinker's influential book of, of 2002. And we can now be absolutely sure at the molecular level that with us humans, both nature and nurture are deeply at work in our brains in a quite natural way. Nature produced a language-making, society-making species that through its customs and laws counteract some of our earlier evolved impulses and instincts. Um, there's a, a wonderful uh, researcher named Nir Kalisman at Hebrew University uh, who uh, had a, an essay published by the National Academy of Sciences uh, called uh, The Microcircuitry of the Human Neocortex as a blank slate. As a matter of fact, he used the, ter the Latin term, Locke's term, tabula rasa. Uh, the, and and I, I wrote to Kalsman because I wanted to find out, okay, I'm reading all these technical details. Can I say that <laughs> these Lockean implications are what your research is showing? Now, the neocortex, I, by the way, when I first read this, I, I may not be aware, and I'm sure many of you are not aware, that uh, you have, we have these parts of the brain, the hippocampus and the, the hippocampus and the amygdala and so on, and those earlier evolved so-called reptilian brain. Uh, well, that is pretty well uh, gene controlled, but the neocortex, which is where language occurs, and most of the things that we are concerned with in teaching and learning in school, that turns out to be uncontrolled by genes, but and is controlled by experience. So what gets imprinted on most of the, the, the largest areas of our brain uh, is undefined in, in advance and it's up to society and, the, and all the older people in a society to imprint upon the child's mind. So anyway, I, I asked Cosman some kind of question whether that was the implication and he wrote back, the biological circuitry in the cortex is so flexible as to allow any form of knowledge and behavior to be taught to it. Locke was right, in other words. And what that means for us school teachers is simply that it's up to society, up to us to decide what gets imprinted on that child's brain. In other words, it's not, uh, a, 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 we don't go to Piaget to decide what the next stage is or what the next stage should be. Nature is not in charge. In fact, nature is saying, uh, it's up to you and your society to decide what kind of society you'll have, what should be taught to children in these early grades. That, uh, and if you go, think back about Ben Franklin's uh, change to what Jefferson had written in the Declaration of Independence, it's not, we, we hold these truths to be natural, we hold these truths to be uh, printed in our amygdalas, no. It's we hold these truths to be self-evident. That is, we ourselves have to determine uh, what works and what needs to work in our society. Um, the human society should itself decide what to teach its young, not leave it to the instincts and powers of the very young child, uh, which was the, uh, the progressive tradition. Um, so, the new science uh, does not, and, and this is my uh, final remark, the, the new science does not challenge the child's individuality. Each child is, of course, different genetically. Each, each child has different DNA. The new science says that each child's development is incompletely defined. The newest science is saying 
that Dewey got it backwards when he said that we should follow the instinct and powers of the child. We now know that the sociological naturally precedes the psychological. That is to say, children are already language speaker members. They're already members and enmeshed in a society by the time any of us teachers reaches that child. The old term for education was formation. It wasn't development. And formation is the more accurate term for what happens in, both, in education, both early and late. Uh, children are not there to be developed. They are there to be formed. That news that there exists no inherent blueprint in the child needs to get to our education schools as soon as possible. We need to start revising some of the doctrines that are being written on the neocortexes of our teachers. Uh, what is most natural to humans is to reverse some of our standard priorities and to be fair to uh, earlier thinkers if some of these thinkers had known what we are fortunate enough to have access to now, they would not have produced some of the ideas that now control uh, what we do in our schools. So I'll end this talk by reverting to our little classroom scene in uh, Mesopotamia and the city of Babylon, which is, uh, by the way, it's, uh, Bab uh, Mesopotamia is quite a nice word for young kids to know because it connects with hippopotamus, which is uh, also very interesting, we find out, to, to, to young children. Uh, as the students march through the grades, building up their language and knowledge with commonly shared topics, uh, our little classroom community, as I suggested, becomes a vigorous learning community because th the background is being prepared for each child as we proceed. Uh, speech community, it seems to me, one of the key phrases that every teacher and education policymaker needs to know. Uh, <laughs> a speech community is what you get when everybody is able to supply what psycholinguistics call the right situation model. Or when everyone in your office or meeting can internally supply what's needed for comprehension. You will get an effective nation with an effective educational system when it produces a nationwide speech community. And one that enables everybody to just apply the needed situation models when they hear and see things in the public sphere, in newspapers, TV, and the workplace. And so let me end by saying that's the true secret to 21st century skills is to have enough commonality of knowledge to understand what's going on. The real meaning of a common language and of, a, of a, an effective public sphere in a democracy. Thank you very much. Sure.